Our sermon text will be in Ephesians chapter 4. It's Ephesians chapter 4. I'll be reading verses 1 through 16. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Let's pray. God of grace and mercy, we praise you today uh, for your word. Uh, We praise you for... Uh, the way that it speaks uh, truth to us, and we praise you uh, for uh, just the blessing of these people gathered together who uh, you have called uh, to be part of uh, this body of Christ at Stony Hill. Uh, We are praying today that you would help us to rightly understand your word and apply your word by your Spirit's power. Uh, So we are praying, God, for a miracle. We are praying for the kind of work that we cannot do, but we desperately need you to do in and among us. So God, help us uh, to respond to your word rightly, to rightly understand your word, and then to be helped to do what your word calls us to do. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, One heartbreaking matter uh, for Christian parents is when their children falter in their faith. Uh, The parents have explained the gospel to them. They've they've perhaps brought them to church for a period of time. Uh, The children understand that that they are sinners and that they can only have their sins forgiven through Jesus Christ. And so these things are known. Uh, By the way, this is the gospel message that, that, that... Uh, saves us, and if you are not familiar with the gospel, I encourage you to speak with us after this service about this gospel message. Uh, But I want to continue to think about this, uh, what happened with these children. They were brought brought up to walk with God, and yet at some point they begin to seriously falter. Now, though it doesn't always happen this way, it oftentimes actually happens around the time that they get to be older teens or they're about to leave the house. Uh, Maybe they actually do leave the house, and sooner or later they're faltering. And by the way, I say falter here because it can look a couple of different ways. Sometimes it's just this child wanders around a bit, uh, lives, you know, kind of sows his wild oats, as we say, and comes back to the Lord. And there it's not exactly clear, did that chi- was that child never saved and just got saved, but, or they were saved and they just had a, a, a period of wandering, and, and the details don't really matter. But I, I, that's kind of what I'm focusing on here. It could also be, be that these children walk away and they never come back. Of course, that demonstrates that they never were saved. And so this faltering is agonizing for the parents because during the process, the parents can't say, well, this is no problem. You know, kids sow their wild oats. I know that they're going to come back. You know, it doesn't matter how they live. You can't say that, right? Because the Bible makes it clear it does matter how you live. You will know them by their fruits. So this is a heartbreaking thing for the parents. It's an agonizing thing for the parents. And and one of the ways that we kind of get warned about this is, you know, well, you're going to raise your kids and they're going to grow up and they're going to go off to college and that's where 
you know, they're going to get their faith wrecked, you know. Some professor is going to say this, some, uh, somebody, some smart student is going to say that, and they're not going to know what to say, and we might even say in this situation, oh, oh, by the way, and so we, we try to prepare them for that, right? We try to say, get ready. But you know, all the kids don't even want to get ready. <laughs> You're saying, dig into the word, and they're like, hey, did you see this new phone I just got? Right, and that's... And so, uh, this is just a, it's just a hard thing. Um, and we might say that this unprepared child is almost being tossed to and fro <laughs> by the teachings that are out there, the false teachings that are out there. And of course, this is a connected to our text today. But what I want to think about, uh, about this is that the, the heart, most heartbreaking part is that the child knows better, doesn't he? or she, they know better. They've heard the truth of the faith. Many parents have prayed fervently for these children, wishing that they could do something in the place of their child. But in many cases, the child is interested again in other things, or perhaps in the worst case, the child is not even truly converted anyway, so they don't have a, a new heart. And the parents know that they cannot walk in faithfulness for their child. They cannot give their child a new heart. And so they pray that God would do what only God can do. Show mercy. Forgive her sins through Jesus Christ. Cause her to long to walk in faithfulness. And if she's not a Christian, give her a new heart. For a moment, how a conversation might go between a father and a wayward child in this situation. Imagine the father saying that he only wants what is best for the child. I want what's for your good. Can't you see this? I want you to be, I want you to be established because I want what's for your good. And the child is thinking, I don't know. I mean, I want to I do my own thing. I wanna, I've got my own interest. I just like to pursue those. And, and again, our heart breaks. I want you to turn your attention now to a different father your own heavenly father. Because your own heavenly father has desires for his children. Saints. That's what our text is calling you. Saints. And the text says that your heavenly father desires for us as a church body to have maturity. You know the kind of maturity So when someone says false doctrine, we're able to stand? He longs that we are not merely wanting to know the minimum that we need to know and just kind of stick with the milk of the word. Like the Father in our story, God the Father does not want you to be tossed about by false doctrine. So he insists that you have strong faith, a deep knowledge of God. Moreover, he wants you to understand that the way, uh, the way that the church family has been arranged is this. All saints need the ongoing, sustaining ministry that comes only by you being connected to Christ. And yet, there's a sense uh, uh, in God's way of arranging things that you not only receive sustaining grace from Christ, but you sometimes minister to one another. We'll get to that in a little bit. But God means for you to be a conduit through which God's word is heard by somebody else. And this is God's, your heavenly father's plan for each of us, for our local church body. And my question for us as we begin, are we like the wayward child, fearing that God's good plan for us, you know, know the scriptures, be well established, that sounds like a bore. Or do we trust our Father's wisdom, believe that pursuing His plan for our corporate maturity is a wise plan and will lead to the, a joy, joyful church, a stable church, a fruitful church? Our theme then is a stable and yet truth-speaking church. We look then at our outline, just three points, a church of stability, a church of truth speaking, and a church with every part doing its part. 
First then, a church of stability. We're looking mainly here at verse 14. So that we may, not be taught, we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Now, in order to help us understand this, I'm just going to review the context. We've been in this section for, this may be our fourth week, so you're familiar. But let me go, let me go quickly. Uh, there's the, God has given the church pastors and teachers, elders, overseers, and, and, and the task of those uh, men is to preach the word, to teach sound doctrine, to guard against false faith, or fa false teaching rather, uh, to shepherd people, uh, to, to, to disciple people, to mentor people, to help people grow up in their faith. And he does that so the saints themselves, that's all of you, would be equipped to do something that's helpful in making this church stronger. And you would do that, as the text says, right? Your saints are being equipped to do the work of the ministry. There's ministry for you to do. There's work for you to do. And you would do this by receiving the ministry and yet speaking the word to one another. Uh, through, and you also would not be exempt from also being mentors, older women for younger women, older men mentoring younger men. There's work for you to do as well. In this way, the entire church body, that is all the church members, which we believe are just regenerate people, so all the saved people here, would become strong in their faith. Right? You know God. You, you, you know sound doctrine. You are, together we, be, we reach mature manhood. Right? We can, we can identify false doctrine. We can refute it by actually quoting real verses. We know what we believe and we know why we believe it. And we, we grow up into the fullness of Christ. That is, we become more and more like Christ. And that is God's desire for you, child of God. That's your Father's desire for you. And why would God want us to do this? Because it is dangerous for a church to be immature and weak. It's dangerous for people to not be solid in the Scriptures. It's dangerous. We're vulnerable if we're weak. If we just have a, a vague idea of what we believe and somebody else comes along and says something that sounds pretty good, we just go that way and then we just go that way, we are going to be blown around, that's what the warning of this text is, you're going to be blown around by people who are just uh, foolish, that is, they just lead us down waste of time ways to go, or they could be worse. They are scheming, conniving, deceitful people who want to wreck your faith if they can. And so, we know that the, that the deceiver wants this church to be unfruitful. And he's, he's got all kinds of schemes for that. But one of the schemes is convincing you, you, you that you just, you just, you know, the gospel's so basic, we just need to know the basics. And, and, and if he can keep you there, you're just completely uninterested in going deep and understanding sound doctrine, then, he's, then you're, just, you're just vulnerable to be blown around wherever. So he, he wants us to be unfruitful. He wants us to not produce any mature saints here. He doesn't want us to, to mentor the next generation so that the next generation of elders and deacons who may be in fourth grade now could be brought up to maturity. <laughs> like he, he wants us to be busy doing other things, not maturing the next generation, not maturing the young men, not maturing the young women, Right? He wants us to reach nobody in the community with the gospel. That's what he wants. So he wants a weak church. You know, I experienced a bit of this firsthand when I went to college. I went off to college and I, uh, uh, I, I went to this Bible study. And it was kind of one of those interdenominational Bible studies, and I didn't really know what I was getting into. And somebody in the Bible study said something. And, uh, and, and it was something that I... Uh, had grown up in church, I didn't think was right. Right now, nobody. By the way, this was not an embarrassing moment publicly because nobody publicly humiliated me. But what I realized is that somebody said something that I was sure was wrong, and I rehearsed in my head in case somebody asked me, you know, what's what's your answer here, Jeff? Do you have an answer? And I thought, yeah, I got one. Here it is. Oh yeah, you're wrong. Like that's all I had. I had no Bible verse. I had no really good argument. I had nothing. And thankfully, this was not one of those shake your faith moments. 
<laughs> but it was one of those you're pathetic moments. <laughs> I'd been in church my whole life, and I didn't know, I couldn't connect, you know, what I had been taught. To, I, didn't, I hardly read my Bible, so no wonder I didn't know what Bible verses were connected to this. And it was just one of those simple questions. The question doesn't even matter. It's just, I couldn't, I, I, I wasn't ready to defend the faith. And had this been a worse situation where people were asking me direct questions and maybe these people were unbelievers, who knows what could have happened that day, right? I was ready to be blown here and there. I wasn't rooted. I was unprepared. And I want to be clear here, I was responsible for my ignorance, right? For a little while, I used to like to think, well, my church, they were really bad at, you know. <laughs> the funny thing is, I have no way of knowing if they good, did a good job teaching people because I wasn't really listening, <laughs> right? right? They could have been doing great teaching. I was counting ceiling tiles, right? So, so I had a responsibility <laughs> to want to become mature, and I didn't. So I'm, just, I'm not blaming my home church. But I want to be, uh, what we want to see here, and even to this day, I don't know, well, anyway, the, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I was definitely a Christian then, but really immature, if I was an unbeliever. Honestly, like I said at the beginning, it doesn't exactly matter. What I know is that now I am, and that there's spiritual fruit there. Too many people get caught up, and what if I right now, you know, got saved? What would that mean about the last 20 years? And it doesn't matter how long you've been saved, just are, have you repented? Are you trusting in Christ? Are you united to Christ by faith? Don't worry about the question about what this means for the past 20 years. If you need to repent, if you need to turn to Christ, just do it. And don't let your pride get in the way. What I knew is that I needed to confess my sinful apathy. I needed to trust Jesus for the forgiveness of that sin. And I needed to pray that God would give me a heart to care about these matters. But what about you? Can you say that you have become mature? That you care about sound doctrine? You're becoming more mature in these things. That together as a congregation, we are mature because we long to know the deep things of God's word and to know not just general ideas of what we believe, but we can show from the scriptures because we are students of the scriptures. We can say and we can defend and we, can, we are rooted in the truth. Is that something we're interested in? And if we're not, the best thing you can do is to just openly confess it as sin. And to believe that Jesus Christ can forgive that sin and pray for God to give you a heart that longs to be part of the solution of us as a church body being strong and mature in our faith. <sighs> lastly, I want to emphasize on this point, <laughs> lastly on this point, uh, I want to emphasize the essential component of not only the knowledge of right doctrine but a love for the Savior. One of the things we've been seeing in this text is this text is pointing to a lot of things that are important about doctrine, but actually just as important, I would say perhaps more important, is actually whether or not you love the God that you know so much about. I see lots of people who, who, uh, who get caught up in having to know everything and they, they, they kind of divorce knowing God from loving God, like they just really work on knowing God and they haven't really bothered to ask, has that helped them to love God more? Because that's actually the whole point. Like the greatest commandment is to love God. Uh, and uh, I want to say that sound arguments are fine, but they're no replacement for strong affection for God. Uh, sound arguments without a love for God will win you an argument on the college campus and then leave you cold, uh, with a cold heart toward the Lord when you return home at night. Right? Your heart is just cold toward the Lord. I, I showed him how smart I was, and then I don't really care about the Lord. I just won the, won the argument you know, about. So the point of this, the purpose of God's maturity in your life is a strong faith, a well-rooted knowledge of God, a soundness in, in the faith and in, in sound doctrine, and yet married to a strong love for God. And that, we believe, is the right understanding of what chapter 4, verse 13 says when it says we grow into the fullness of Christ. We want to be like Christ, not just in the way that we live and not just in the way that we know knowledge, but by the way that we love God himself. 
I have to move on. I'm, I'm taking too, way too long on point one. Point two is this. A church of truth speaking. Now here we're looking mainly at verses 15. Mainly verse 15. Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. Now this is the main point here of this. God's will is that every church be a place where all the people... All the people of God speak the truth of God in love to each other when we gather. That's the focus of this text, by the way. You're, you're to be a truth speaker. Like, you're, you're, you're charged to speak truth. And, and by the way, uh, mainly when we think of truth, let me just help us really put a, put a point on this. It doesn't just mean true things that you think. Like, I think I don't like the way you look in that dress. That's not mainly what we're talking about. Some people actually think that's what speaking the truth is. I don't like the way you look in that dress, right? That's, that is speaking the truth, and that's not what this text is encouraging you to do. This text is encouraging you to consider the truth to be the truth of God's word and sound doctrine, and then feel that it's your responsibility to speak something of the Lord to each other when you gather week by week. Now, that's the main part of this text. Beyond this text, I think we can make an argument from Scripture that you're supposed to speak the truth of God's Word outside of this meeting as you proclaim the gospel to your unbelieving friends. That's for another sermon and another text. Today, our main focus is that speaking the truth in love is a charge that you have to speak something of the Lord to each other. One of the things that I oftentimes say is that when you come to church, the most common thing to have happen is to have the appointed teachers speak God's word, right? I'm an appointed teacher. Your Sunday school teacher was an appointed teacher. You might go to Awana, there's an appointed teacher. And the most odd thing is to have someone who's not an appointed teacher to speak the truth. Not that they couldn't, but, you know, we feel like we got that part, and so maybe it's not our job to do that. And we just talk about how you're weak and how's your, right? And that's fine to talk about how's your weak and so on, but... but I want you to feel from this text the responsibility to have something, something like bring a psalm, a hymn, a spiritual song, have something to bring by which you can either encourage someone, build them up in some way, help the grieving. Is there some way that you can be one who not only receives God's word when you come week by week, but actually uh, distribute God's word? Your speaking the truth of the Bible to other Christians when we gather is, humanly speaking, one of the main ways God will grow our church into the spiritual maturity that God says we have to have. So you may say, why why haven't we reached it? Well, everybody has to start speaking the truth to each other, in love. Or to put it another way, when you don't speak God's word to other church members, you fail to be part of God's plan for building up this church. Your silence has an effect. You're here to speak the truth in love. So the the means then is speaking the truth. Uh, The goal, speaking the truth in love rather, the goal then is that we can all be built up. God wants us to be strong, mature. All the things we've been talking about in this series Here we have to understand that we have to speak the truth in love, and here we must understand that uh, love compels us to speak the truth. Um, Today in our world, they're confused about what it means to speak the truth, or what love is, rather. Loving somebody is to basically never tell them anything, that they're doing anything wrong. Right? And the Bible completely contradicts that. The most loving thing to do is to tell someone the truth. If someone's in open, rebellious sin against God, the loving thing to do, we've been taught by society, is to just either not say anything or to affirm them, to approve of the things that God forbids. That's the most loving thing to do according to society. The Bible teaches something completely different, that the most loving thing we could do is to tell them, to, 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 to urge them to consider God's word on this matter, this lifestyle that you've chosen, this thing you've decided to do, contradicts a clear command of your loving creator who has given you commands for your good. Can I speak with you and help you see how God is loving to give you this command? Like the wayward child, the the world wants to say, oh, you're giving me this command to make my life terrible. (laughs) And we need to just plead with them. 
that we, we really mean their good. We mean their eternal good. But it, but it keeps us from affirming them in their sin, doesn't it? Makes that completely n- not an option to affirm them in their sin. But to pray that by God's help we can speak to them in a loving way that shows a real care for their eternal soul. Not in the most clumsy way you can think of, but in the, in the most kind way you can conceive. But still to speak the truth. It has to be spoken lovingly, and I would say especially in the church. We were talking a little bit about outside the church. I think this text is focusing on how we're supposed to speak in the church. We're supposed to speak here, lovingly, inside this this community. Right? Some believe that their charge to speak the truth gives them the license to say whatever's on their mind in whatever way comes to mind. And that, again, completely off limits. No, you may not say whatever comes to mind in whatever way you think about saying it. Not at all. Uh, You must speak God's word and you must speak it clearly and and lovingly, rather. We're charged to love our fellow believer, even if they are in sin. That does not mean you can't, that you are free to speak to them however you want. Speak to them in love. Speak out of a heart of a compassion that wants to see them return to the Lord. We'll be able to, uh, by God's grace, uh, Lord willing, in a few weeks, come to this passage in uh, later in chapter 4, verse 29, that says this, let no corrupt talk comes out of your mouth, but only such as good for building up. Just think about that. Just let that be the rule. I'm about to say something to somebody in this church. Will this help build them up? Or the contrary, will this tear them down in some way? don't say it. Will this help build them up? Will this work for their spiritual good? Later on, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. <laughs> did I, did, when you spoke to them, do you think that they felt, wow, that was a, that was a gracious gift from God, that, that, that word, that tone, that, <laughs> that opinion? The Lord has something to say about what we say and how we say it. Well, we have to speak. We have to move on. We want to grow up into Christ. We want to become mature believers. This is God's call for us as a church. So we speak the truth in love, aiming that God would use your words to help other Christians grow in their faith. Last point, point number three, a church where every part is doing its part. Here we're, we're, I'm going I'm to read verse 15 again. We're mainly going to be in 16 here, but here it says, We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body uh, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is doing, is working properly and makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. And interesting, we are to build ourselves up in love, right? Not apart from Christ, but relying on Christ. We are to build ourselves up. It's your responsibility to help this body be built up into spiritual maturity. You might think of ways that you can do that. It's a challenge from this text, I think. We are charged to build ourselves up. Now, I believe this text is best understood by thinking about Jesus' words in John 15. That's why we prayed over John 15 uh, today in our prayer time. There, Jesus says, I'm the vine and you are the branches, and it makes it clear that you will not become a Christian without being connected to Christ, and having been made a Christian by being united to Christ, you will never produce spiritual fruit except that what it takes to produce spiritual fruit comes from Christ. That's why you have to stay connected to Christ. If you think, I'll just on my own produce fruit, it'll never happen because spiritual, true, genuine spiritual fruit only comes from Christ. So you don't just need Christ to save you, you need Christ to work in you and through you to produce spiritual fruit, and it will only come as you recognize and you see, and then God blesses through, through Christ sending what is needed to produce spiritual fruit in you. You have to remain in Christ. The whole of your Christian life relies on Christ. Again, this idea that some people have, we just need Christ for salvation, and after that we just go on. That's, that's ridiculous. We, we, we must rely on Christ for every aspect of our Christian life. And so we come here 
to look at this text. And the picture is of the church. And now, and I don't think it contradicts. I think we just have to understand it properly. Now there's a picture of the church. And the church is compared to the body. I'll just use my own for fun. Uh, so that Christ is the head. And that the whole body, that's the church, the whole body, again, according to, Rome, according to John 15, but it's consistent here, every part of this body is going to need something from Christ in order to flourish, be strong, be, you have the kind of maturity and stability that God wants us to have. So every one of you, again, you, when you come week by week, you ought to think, I need something from Christ today. Right? Just get that. Actually, you should think that every day you get up. I need something from Christ today. <laughs> I depend on Christ today to walk as God would have me to walk when I go to work today. I need something from Christ today to have something useful to say to my neighbor. I need something from Christ today to deal with that troubled per that person that we have conflict every time we get together. I need something from Christ today for every aspect of your life. But that is also true in the church. And again, when we come back now to the picture in here, is that God's, the way God sets it up is that he has us to be different parts. So you're familiar with the texts that say, it's, it's Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, that says some people are the hand and, and some people are the, are the foot and, some, you know, and, and we couldn't all be the ears, right? You're familiar with that. But just think about how this works and, and how this text, the way I read this text, let me just read verse 15 again where it says every part is doing its part. We're all joined together and every part's doing its part. I think there's a, part of the logic of this text is uh, let's just focus for a minute on the elbow, right? That there's some of the logic of this text is that the job of the elbow is to actually not get in the way, but be part of the ways that the hand actually gets some, some connection, at least churchly speaking, the nutrients that he needs. So that the elbow considers himself, if the elbow would, first of all, not receive the, what comes from God, the sustaining power of God, the elbow would... Uh, be weak and useless, or rather if the elbow kept it all to himself, still it's, it's through the elbow that the hand receives. Now, I don't want to push that too far, but what I do want to say is I think the point of this text is that you are to be a recipient of what comes from Christ and then turn around and give it to somebody else. And I think that's the logic of verse 15. Let me read it again, in 16, and see if it makes sense to you. Right? So we're, we're all connected to Christ from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which is equipped. We're all held together by each other, right? How do we stay a church? I, we're held together. If the elbow leaves, the arm is just flopping around, right? The, we are held together. And then when each part is working properly, now what's working properly? You're, you're, you're receiving and you're distributing you're, th through you. The kinds of things that need to be said to other people in this church oftentimes m needs to come through you. When each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. I don't know if I lost you on the illustration, but this is the way I think that it works. You are a recipient of God's word, and you turn and you speak God's word to others. You receive, you give. If you are not interested in receiving that much, you're hurting the overall health of the church. If you receive, but do not give it to anybody else, you are working against the overall health of the church. You have a responsibility. So how can we end? I'm not sure of your part in the church. What I'm not trying to do here is collapse everybody into one unit. I'm, I, the Bible clearly makes a distinction between pastors, teachers, and elders and the rest of the church, right? I have particular responsibilities uh, with, with preaching and teaching the word, prayer, oversight, shepherding, uh, defending the faith, equipping the saints. I have many things that I do that everybody else doesn't have to do. Yet that being said, that doesn't mean as the saints that you have nothing to do. The ministry... If, if you're equipped to do the ministry, you have ministry to do. I have ministry to do too, but you have ministry to do. And again, our church will only be as healthy as God means it to be when every part does its part. That's basically the whole point of verse 16. So as a saint, you're charged to do ministry by receiving the word 
and then turning around and speaking true things from God's word to other people in this congregation. I don't know what it would look like for you to do that. Perhaps you would be the one that God would have to give counsel to somebody else who's struggling with a particular sin. Somebody's going through a hard time and you know the situation and you're a good friend of that person and you can give the kind of counsel that somebody who doesn't know them as well is not in a position to do. Perhaps you're the one that God has blessed with a rich time in God's word this week and he, he meant you to not only be blessed by that, but to come to church on Sunday and say, you know, the Lord really blessed me with this truth from my Bible study on Tuesday. Can I talk to you about it for a couple minutes? And you're just, you're just, you receive a blessing from God and you just turn around and try to encourage other people. Wow, if our conversations in the hallways were full of the speaking of God's word to each other. Again, you might be the one who needs to confront a brother and sister on sin that you know about. You might be the one that God means to be the mentor to the next, you know, to a future elder in this church in 20 years. And you're going to mentor them now, and you might die before they even become an elder, and yet they are an essential elder in the church, an essential leader that this church needs, and you're playing your part now by investing in that young woman and investing in that young man and speaking a word of encouragement to that person. And saying, you know what, brother, I think you're heading in the wrong direction over here. It cannot be that the word of God only comes from one, t- one guy on a Sunday morning. Or even the Sunday school classes before that. God has a part for us all to play in that. To receive the word and then also to, to minister to one another. This is your heavenly father's plan for Stony Hill. Let us not be like the wayward child, not interested in our father's plans, and somehow doubting that it would really work out in the end. Rather, may we trust our father's wise plan, and in prayerful dependence on him, pray for a heart that longs to do the part he's given us to do, and then rest on the empowerment from him. You're like, I don't have anything. Well, great. Well, Christ will give you all you need to minister grace to others. Rest in Christ's wisdom and his strength, not your own. You may be surprised how much God can use you in this congregation. May Stony Hill be built up then into Christ by having the words of Christ come lovingly from, the, from our lips day by day. And in this way, by God's help, may we be built up in love. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for your good plan for our church. Give us uh, just an excitement (laughs) for the wisdom of your plan. Work against any doubt that resides in the heart of one who feels they're not quite ready to be useful in this way. Teach them to not rest in their own competency, but in yours. On the other hand, humble those who tend to overestimate their own competency and remind them that if anything good is going to come from a proud heart like that, it will only come by the Spirit's power. Teach us all to remember the vital connection that we must have to our head, Jesus Christ. Make us all long to receive from Christ and then to faithfully distribute from what we've received from Christ to one another, joyfully submitting and being on board with your great plan for this church that through in this way we would all be built up in love. We pray this would all happen to your great glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.